Okay, so today we're going to talk about short circuit strength of uh, three phase transformers. The work uh, is based around um, um, basically starting with the left hand rule of uh, Fleming. So here you can see um, the, um, the field, the magnetic field here, the, the, you can see the current flowing down here and the force there. So with the left hand rule, you can see that the force is there. So you've got the current perpendicular to the field, perpendicular to the direction of the force. So this is the fundamental idea that you need to understand when you're working out short circuit forces. And one of the things here is that the, the force, sorry, the, the, uh, the force is proportional to the current times the field and the field is proportional to the current. So the force is proportional to the current squared. So for a, a, a doubling of the current, you actually increase the force in the transformer by a factor of four. So you can see this effect here, that the, the, the current is very much amplified in terms of the force, because the force is proportional to I squared. Now, when you have a short circuit on a transformer, it's limited by three things. One is the voltage, one is the, uh, the impedance, and one is the resistance of the, of the circuit. So when we put the short circuit, if this is a, a low impedance source, and this impedance is low, and this resistance is low, you'll have a very large short circuit. So short circuit current is dictated by voltage, resistance and impedance and the other thing of course is that it's dictated by the time of the fault in other words the point on wave in which the fault occurs if the, if the fault occurs at a, at, a, at, a, at a zero current crossing then the, the, the force will be much less if the um, fault occurs on a maximum of course the uh, maximum current the force will be much higher so We've gone through, after going through those fundamentals, now we're going to look a little bit of, at, of detail in terms of the windings of the transformer based on a single phase equivalent circuit. So here we have the core model here, then we have the inner winding and the outer winding. The outer winding is shown here as positive and the, sorry, and the outer winding, so they're going in, the current's flowing in two different directions in terms of the ampere turns. Here is the leakage flux field. So you can see this is a function of the coupling between the two windings. So if we have this gap very small, of course the, the coupling will be better and the field and the and the leakage field will be will be uh, will be less. So using using the rule that we've just had, Fleming's left hand rule, you can see that the the force is down in this direction, so it's got a it's got a uh, radial and an axial component. So there's the axial force and then the radial force. So this winding, no matter which way you look at it, is being pushed out. So the outer winding has been pushed out. And also, the, it's being pushed down and then from the bottom it will be pushed up. Similarly, with the inner winding, the inner winding is being pushed down and also compressed in. So the, the inner winding has a, is, is the radius is being reduced, the outer winding, the radius is increasing because of the hoop stress, the bursting force. So the inner winding is in compression, like shown. And the outer winding is, is in tension. It's been trying to be pulled apart. Now, depending on how you support your winding, there's two different methods. One is the, the shear section modulus or strength of the copper or the aluminium. Or what you can do is put more supports inside the winding. In other words, if you look at that, that's not very well supported. That's more supported. That's more supported. That's more supported. So you have a, a span 
you're reducing the span between the support points. It's just like in, in, um, in mechanical engineering. You have these two points and you have a beam. It's the same thing. And you have constant force down like that. So by reducing that span, you're reducing the, 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 the deflection. So we've, we've determined that the inner winding compresses and the outer winding is expanding. So if you have a look at the effect of um, typical failures, here you have a typical failure which is a function of not enough supports. Here you have a typical failure due to inadequate section modulus of, or, or strength of the shear copper. So you can actually see on when you have a, sh a short circuit failure on a transformer by looking at if it's just got one bolus like that or if it's got multiple loops like that, you know what has caused the problem. So now we're going to go into a little bit more detail, but before I get into the detail, the force distribution in the winding varies as per the amp turns. So as you move out on the inner winding, from here to here, or from, from, from the outer to the inner, the ampere turns increase, and on the outer winding it increases. So, hence the force, the force actually varies as, as, as the ampere turns or the current, the current increases in the field. So, what we've done is we've assumed the mean. So we've got the minimum up here and the maximum up here. We're working with the, with the mean, the mean force, in terms of compression and in terms of expansion. This is the inner winding, this is the outer winding. So this is the force distribution across the inner and the outer windings. Now, I'm going to show you a few combinations of what happens depending on how the windings are configured. Um, yeah, over here, I've drawn the inner winding and the outer winding with the same length, so they're not axially displaced. So the field here looks like this on, the, on this winding, the inner winding, and the field on the outer winding looks like this. And the force, the force distribution looks like this in terms of, we're talking about axial forces now. So the axial forces are pushing down and pushing down on this winding, and on the outer winding it's the same, you're pushing down and pushing down. So it gradually builds up as you move from here because of the shape of the leakage field. Now we introduce a displacement of the windings for some reason, say for example they were built in correctly, uh, or there was some movement during the drying out process of, or assembly of the transformer. So we've got a displacement. You can see that the field is radically changed. And the field, the field on, the, uh, on the outer winding, that's the inner winding, that's the outer winding, is radically changed. It's now got a completely different shape. It's, it's, it's displaced in two different directions. And also the field now has changed because now we've got some vertical force and we've in terms of and we've got some down force. So the inner winding here, this winding here is near is at the top part here, is seeing some pushing force to push the top ampere turns of the winding up. And down here, this winding is being just trying to be displaced down. Now that is very important in terms of power transformers because you have to have a, a ring, a compression ring at the top to be able to withstand that capability. Now another th case is when you have a gap on the outer winding which you might have in high voltage and you have the outer winding split into two. Now you can see now the field is radically displaced and different. And now you've got some forces, you've got some forces here on the inner winding up, on the outer winding up here and here, but then you've got some forces down there and you've got some forces up here. And here you've got forces down here 
it, this is totally in compression, but these outer windings, which might be the high voltage winding, now has axial components at the top of each, at top and bottom of the winding. So depending on how the gaps in the winding and the displacement of the winding can radically change the field, and then that can radically change the force distribution within the windings. Now, depending on the type of configuration of windings that you've got, when you have compression in a, in a disc winding, which consists of individual copper or aluminium uh, conductors, which are rectangular, you can have a tilting effect, whereby the conductors are tilted due to the compression. Compression I'm talking about, talking about here, where you have these windings in compression and compression. You squeeze the disc, you squeeze the disc, and the disc, because it has inadequate section modulus, actually tilts. If you made this more squarer, the section modulus would be stronger, and then it, wouldn't, it would tend to be stronger and wouldn't tilt. But normally they are rectangular. And then, if you've got a helical winding, the forces, depending on how they're applied, can actually try to twist the helical windings together more, or actually undo the helical winding. For example, if it's a foil winding in a, in a typically dry type transformer, which it has used aluminium foil or, or, uh, al, um, or copper foil, you can actually be undoing the winding or trying to twist the winding together. So all this information is, is general information on problems of short circuit in transformers. And all this information uh, comes back to an article written back um, by um, Mr. Walters, Malcolm Walters, back in the 1930s and 1940s. And the paper written by Walters on the short circuit strength of power transformers is the definitive article that most um, electrical engineering companies have used in terms of calculation of the forces in power transformers due to, due to short circuit. Now most people in terms of doing calculations to determine all these problems use finite element um, calculations in computers. And we use finite element because what we've got to actually determine is the whole, ma the whole field um, plot. Once we have the field plot and we know the current, we can actually then determine the force and determine the whole force distribution through the, tra through the transformer. On the inner winding, on the outer winding, on the tertiary winding, on the tapping winding. So in terms of calculation, um, most transformer companies would use finite element methods and, and, and use the finite element methods to actually be able to plot the leakage field under short circuit conditions. Knowing the, short, knowing the field, once you know the, a plot of the field, you can then, using finite elements also for each element, actually plot the um, re resultant force and take the axial and, uh, and radial component of that in, in, in terms of working out the, um, the radial forces and the axial forces on the transformer. So it's very hard to do that manually but with finite element, it's very, very uh, quick and easy. And that allows you then, once you know the mechanical capabilities of the, of the, um, the materials that you're working with and the support beams and the support methods, um, whether it be epoxy resin, whether it be uh, dry type transformers, whether it be um, oil impregnated transformers, it's all the same, you, you know the strength of your materials and then you can work out your safety factors based, based on your uh, radial force and your uh, axial force. So, I repeat that this, this work is, is uh, in, in the 1940s and 1950s would have been quite difficult, but, but with the computer now it's, it's actually quite easy and you can do it quite accurately and you can actually compare it with actual um, short circuit tests that have actually been done in the last 20 to 30 years. Thank you very much.